James, how are you doing today? Great. It's, it's a great time to be in the tax world because all of a sudden we're the most important people at, at a party, at, uh, at a bus <laughs> stop or anyway, because everybody's talking tax. It's like a weatherman that uh, finally gets a storm coming in and he's all over the news, right? <laughs> oh, exactly. And, and I don't know. It's, for, for me, it's like it's the boy that, that cried wolf. It's like uh, we've been saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And the scary part of this is uh, we're in earnings season right now. And uh, it's, it's December 31st. They basically signed the tax law like on the 22nd. And if you're a publicly traded company, you have to report the impact of um, on on your earnings in in this quarter, and so uh, a number of companies, uh, well, from from the firm standpoint, from an auditing standpoint, uh, they basically said it's, it's an, a million extra hours to audit those numbers. Oh my gosh! But the, <laughs> but the interesting thing is the SEC came out and they said, "Hey, we know this is kind of last minute, and so what we're going to allow you to do is say these numbers are either final." or they're provisional, or we have no idea. Now, now <laughs> you probably never want to be in the category of telling the public you have no idea what the impact is, but a num- number of the companies that we work with, they, they fall in this provisional category that um, this is what we think it's going to be. But then uh, I think just yesterday, the AICPA sent a letter to the IRS saying, can you clarify these 25 issues? <laughs> <laughs> and so... So you have companies that are reporting their earnings right now that, that, there's, that there's just a lack of clarity. So uh, if anybody thought there was simplification here, it, it, it didn't happen. Maybe maybe at the lower individual level, but, but certainly not for, for businesses and corporate. Well, and that's why I'm excited to have you on because I mean, even in our world, it, it, I mean, it was everybody was getting advice from every different angle and everybody was contradicting the different advice. So, I mean, you could just totally tell as you went up the chain, even to talking to tax attorneys that everybody was deferring to some other professional when the, like when someone was trying to get a finite piece of advice. Well, yeah. And then, and then, and then even if you just look at the house and the Senate bills, uh, they had some very, uh, very strange language, strange, Strange things. The best example in the world that I live in, and that's fast growing uh, companies that will either go public or have a transaction in the next five years. In the initial uh, bills, they, they were going to tax stock options when they've asked. So think about it you are a private company, you have um, your, your value's gone up, and somebody's stock option vests. They haven't even exercised it yet, but they were going to tax you on that delta between what the fair market value is at that day and what you would have to pay for it with no ability to pay because you couldn't monetize it. You didn't even own the stock. (laughs) And that actually made it into some bills. And I I think we had, certainly in the tech industry, we had a lot of scared people. Well, yeah, because you got a bunch of people that are like in theory going to be rich, but have no money right now. And where are they going to pay that from? (laughs) Oh, exactly. And then if you're the companies, it's like, uh, okay, you have to pay the payroll tax liability on that. And, and so uh, thank goodness that, you know, clear, clear heads prevailed and it didn't make it in, but it, it, there's still some crazy head scratching stuff that, that are in the provisions that, that is a business. If you've not seriously gone through, um, at least talk to a qualified advisor or gone through it, that there's stuff that will be affecting how you're doing business today because it is an effect for this year. Um, and I think it's maybe, a, maybe go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, and that kind of actually is a, is a great point that I wanted to, you know, hear your thoughts on is, you know, it's going to be affecting these businesses in day-to-day operations. And what is that, you know, so there, you know, because of the realm of the companies that you work with, which are you're going to go public or they're going to they're going to have a transaction, and there's I, I I think I'm assuming there's this balance between how do you what what are the changes that are in the day to day you know the annual operations, and then also affecting the businesses that are going to be um, transacting, and what are the what are the di- two different you know a foot in each bucket? What do they got to worry about? And I and I don't expect you to know all the answers, but maybe we can take them kind of like what are the annual impacts that people should be looking at? And then we can you know, take a second part into the transactions. Sure. And maybe talk a little bit about what people are asking about the most. I, I guess it begins with choice of entity, right? 
it all of a sudden you were taxed at 35 percent and on an individual you were at 39 percent or 45 percent depending on which states you live in all of a sudden that rate being at 21 percent is pretty attractive and so those uh from a tax standpoint you're either taxed as a corporation or at 21 percent or your pat taxed as a, a pass-through which could be an s corporation or an llc and you would love it to think that hey it was a straightforward answer whether to choose one entity or the other because what happened is there was this clamoring that if you're going to reduce the corporate rate to 21 percent then the pass-through entities, basically the income gets passed through tax at the individual rate, and those individual rates are still high. So they came up with this uh, deduction, 20% deduction that if you're a pass-through, but they made the rules so complicated that, um, again, you're, you're going to need an accountant to, to help you, which I think is great, fantastic for us. <laughs> but, um, but, but it's really going to be an analysis that you're going to have to do. I mean, it, a couple of just high level analysis, depending on what industries you're in. Uh, I, I think kind of the rule of thumb is that right now, if you're if you're a C corporation, you'd be taxed at twenty twenty one percent, but there's still a, a double taxation if you pay dividends, and those are going to be taxed at, at your whatever the dividend rate is. And whereas if you're a pass through, uh, if you qualify for the twenty percent deduction, it gets you down close to. 21%, but depending on your bracket, may or may not work. So what we're finding is that people have to schedule out what happens if I'm an S corp, what happens is if I'm a C corp, and then you have to layer on top of that your, your really your exit analysis, right? Right. So if you're a family business, you're going to be in this, you're never going to sell, then, then certainly one is more attractive than the other. So, but, but again, what we found is you actually have to put pencil to paper uh, and, and do the analysis because it's, 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 it's not one way or the other, unfortunately. Well, right. And I think, you know, just the chatter that's out anywhere you go. I mean, it's been everywhere in any kind of business community that this is, you know, 90% of what they're talking about. And you hear so many people just wanting to make knee jerk decisions like, oh, I got to be an S or a C corp now. You know what I mean? Or they, they start to make these random okay. assumptions and it's like, whoa, I mean, the ramifications of what you're talking about, because you may or may not know where you're, what your next five years looks like is, is huge. And, you know, what is the, ba- you know, what is the balance as you're starting to, like look at these um, these companies that are going to transact or sell in the next f- few years. What are some of the biggest key takeaways that you're looking at and that are in the analysis that you're helping them with? Well, again, you, know, you go back, and this is this before tax form. Um, uh, if you're going to be acquired or you're going to acquire a company, if you acquire a C corporation, then the people, uh, if I'm going to acquire you, then I don't get a step up in basis in the stock if it's, if it's a straight C corporation. So if I pay, you know, a hundred million for you, then I basically step into the shoes of whatever the, the tax basis is in your company. And I get deductions for that. If you are a pass through or S corporation, then basically I pay a hundred million, I get a hundred million worth of deduction. Mm-hmm. And so this analysis, uh, so, so then it goes back that now you layer on top of this tax form. Well, I may be great at a 21% rate, but when I go to sell my company, all of a sudden I'm not as attractive as a target because they're not going to get a higher basis in, in what they purchase you for. So, so I think there's things like that that come into play, but let, let's talk about what, what what's happening now. You've got companies, large multinationals that are bringing money back because uh, they're going to be taxed on their uh, their earnings uh, that you know the, the larger companies that have accumulated all these uh, all this money offshore they're going to bring it back at a favorable rate so they're going to have a lot of money to spend mm-hmm. and, which is in the past you know they've kept it offshore so really they could only do offshore acquisitions but now this money's going to be back in the U.S. that combined with the fact that uh, instead of their current earnings being taxed at thirty five it's at twenty one there's going to be a lot of cash. And so uh, I think what we see is there, you're going to have a, a, a more viable M&A market from the corporate side. So 
So now if I'm private equity, then I'm a little bit nervous because now I'm competing with more corporates that have cash. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, um, if I'm private equity, uh, there's a, a provision that went in that, that disallows uh, interest uh, over a certain level. And so all of a sudden you had all these leveraged transactions that you had in the past that won't exist because there's a limitation on the amount of interest that you can deduct. Can we, so can we, couple, can we peel that, can we peel that back a layer, James? Cause I think it's an important thing because sure. there's the, the PE firm is really active in the mid market and you know, there's a lot yeah. of banging on doors because I think, you know, a little bit of context and you, you probably have a lot uh, deeper context than I do, but you know, there's what 5,000 plus PE firms and they've got, you know, this, this certain amount of time frame with that they have, have if they raise this money to deploy the capital. So there's like what, almost a trillion bucks sitting there in cash and yeah. maybe, maybe layer you know, and expand on how they usually buy companies because they're knocking on people's doors and there's a lot of really high multiples going on right now because people are trying to earn their commissions to deploy the capital. So there's weird deals going on right now. So, and then can you explain how that works and then how the leverage buyouts work and wh what that impact is on the actual PE firms? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, the the what, what happened in tax reform is there is a limit on interest expense of thirty percent of adjusted taxable income. <laughs> now, again, back to complexity. What? How do you define adjustable taxable income? But in the past, when uh, private equity came in, they would really leverage up the deals and uh, to get that interest expense to, to to get higher returns for their investors. Well, now that you've got this 30% limit, and I think that's going to either change the dynamics in terms of how much they can pay, or they'll just walk away from deals altogether. How much? How, or, how, how or, far were they going up? I mean, if 30 is the limit right now, what were you seeing prior to that? So again, if you, if you, again, it's just the basic math. The less equity I have to put into a deal, the the less you know, the less risk I have, and and the ability to get a higher return. So it, I think it's all over the place, but at the end of the day, I think the take home for the listeners is it's not business as usual anymore. I mean, if, if you're, you're, if you're saying that, Hey, this is the way buyers were looking at me at the past, I've got new buyers. Maybe I need to go out to a, a corporate buyer or to see if there's an opportunity there. Yeah. Right. And I mean, so, so I, I think it changes the dynamics there uh, greatly. And you know, it, Actually, curious because now all this cash is going to be coming back, and so they'll have the you know these these corporations will have the capital. Do they have the infrastructure of the people and the and like the the processes to actually be able to deploy it, or do you do you see this lag time of them getting their almost their little you know beefing up their M and A departments in order to be able to handle the deals and bet them out and all that stuff? Well, I, I think that there's. So the large corporates are probably going to have their M&A people, so those people are going to be more active in the market. I mean, the other issue that you have is uh, shareholders are going to want to return, so you may have more stock buyback. Again, so, so they've, they've got to do something with that cash. And, and again, it seems to me like if, if I'm a, an innovative company, I'm a high-growth company, I want to show investors that uh, – that I've got other choices to deploy that cash. I mean, if I'm just buying back stock, you know, that to me, that, that, that's kind of like giving up. That's the white flag that I have no better use for that cash and therefore I'm going to give it back to you. So, um, so, so that's something that, that, that I, I think it's certainly in the M&A game. The other thing is um, certainly with uh, being able to expense, 100% uh, expensing, Asset deals could be a little bit more interesting, especially in capital intensive industries where I acquire a company, I could arguably expense up to 100% of the purchase price. And how does that differ than what it was before? And like in the actual. Uh, so so the way you had before is typically you depreciate the property that you acquire over 5, 10, 15, 39 years. And the, the, what the law, new law comes in for certain assets that you acquire, you're able to expense that uh, uh, 100%. So if we take this out of the, the context of M&A, and let's just talk about operating a business, here's another disrupt. Here, here's another, what I like to call a tax disruptor, that tax reform is really disrupting the way business is done. And that is, if, if, I, am, if, I'm a, if I make equipment, 
then all of a sudden I've got a lot more buyers for my equipment because all of a sudden I can go to them and say, you can expense a hundred percent. Now the interest is the flip on this is I, I was talking to a company the other day and he got all excited about expensing hundred percent of the purchase. But then he says, but wait, I've been using depreciation as a shield against paying taxes in every year. So what you're telling me is I can expense it all this year, but in next year, I'm not going to have that deduction. I'm going to have to buy something more. I go, yes, it'll, it'll be your new drug, <laughs> right? So, so what, we, what we've said is not only do you have to model out the current year, but you really ought to model out your next five years to see what that impact will be. And, and so you, you don't want to get hooked on a drug that, 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 that may not be working for you. So. Well, and I think that it has to be weighed with the, you know, again, even if you're leading up to a transaction, because I don't know how many times I've seen deals derail because they've been buying equipment, depreciating it. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, uh, depreciation recapture. And they realize that they have to pay ordinary income on all that stuff they depreciated over the last 20 years. So they can't actually net as much as they wanted. So, I mean, there's a flip side to both sides of the coin, I think. Oh, oh there is. There is. And, and again, it gets back to, you're going to hear this from a from an account of it. Hey, we love this stuff because it it adds the complexity. But, <laughs> but Job again, security, it, right? <laughs> but, it is, but 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 the messaging here is if if you you've not seriously looked at this, this is going to change the way people do business. Uh, let, let's take another thing. Let's let's say you're doing business internationally, and um, it, it, the the rules are changed and. There may be different flows of uh, that may be taxed that were not taxed before. Um, but it, and another, and this is not necessarily tax reform, but you heard about the tariffs on the solar panels mm -hmm. that came came out the other day. That uh, there's a tariff on solar panels, and so what we found uh, again leading up to tax reform uh, in the America First type theory is we've had a number of foreign companies come to us looking uh, to say, hey, we want to relocate in the U.S. What kind of incentives can we get from states? And so a lot of states wanting to attract manufacturing companies will give incentives uh, for them to relocate to their state from foreign or even within the U.S. Well, the funny thing is, so I thought that so we had this solar company that was going to relocate to the U.S., but when they found out that the tariff starts at 30% that goes down after that, they're saying, well, wait, we were going to relocate. We were going to take advantage of that incentive package. But since the tariff rate goes down 30%, it's still cheaper for us to build it in our, you know, third world country. So. Does it impact, because I know there's been lots of in, uh, international companies that have been, you know, looking to get into the U.S. through acquisition as well. Does that impact, you know, in foreign buyers for domestic companies as well? Oh, oh definitely. Because, again, you, you're looking at different models of your tax at 35 percent. Now it's 21 percent. Those, those acquisitions are going to look a lot more attractive. In fact, I was I was talking to a company the other day that uh, you have inadvertent. So you may have a uh, you have a, a, a deal, a uh, joint venture where you are paying. Uh, you determine a royalty based on a tax rate at a certain point in time. So it was a thirty five. You've got to go back and look at those agreements that you have where that have a, have a tax element. And now instead of thirty five, it's twenty one. That agreement may may need to be redone. There's more money there. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, definitely more money. And then uh, again, let, let's talk about. We had a conference in Palm Springs, a strategic growth forum, back in November. And on the tax panel, we had uh, a couple of high growth companies in in California, and uh, their their number one issue was employees. Because if you think about it, if you're in a high tax state, you no longer have the state and local tax deduction, and that that's that's huge. So, for California, this operates 13 uh, percent. All of a sudden, you're only going to get a ten thousand dollar deduction for that. And so, their concern is now about attracting people to a high tax area. Yeah. So again, here's an uh, here, here's the, like, here's like a business consequence that we didn't think about before, but now I may be losing employees or I may not be able to attract employees because 
that that's a that's a true cost. And right. then on top of that, um, the moving expense deduction got taken away. So now I'm I'm even going to have to pay more. One, I'm going to have to convince them to come pay more state taxes. And guess what? I'm going to not get a deduction for that moving expense. So so again. If, if you were moving people a year ago, then all of a sudden it puts a new lens on it. There's a new cost to, uh, of, of relocating people to a high tax area. And that's those are real dollars, too, because I read a Wall Street Journal article and I can't remember what cities that they they rambled off like New York and a bunch of places in California and such where like the average person was like up in there, you know, the upper 20s or 30s for like the normal deductions. And now it's capped at at. 10,000. So, I mean, that's like literally real dollars out of people's pockets plus the moving expense. I mean, that's a big deal. Oh, it is. I mean, and then it, again, the property tax, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, forget like the state and local income tax, your property tax is probably already at 10,000. And right. so it's, so, so, so then the question is, um, as you look at that, is that going to affect real estate, right? Mm-hmm. Is that going to affect, uh, again, certainly, if you're in a competition with uh, somebody in Austin, Texas, with no tax uh, versus going to Silicon Valley, I mean, could you lose people because, you know, they start doing the math? I mean, California, when um, when the rate went up to 13%, I had a couple of companies that relocated. One went to Houston, the one went to, to Austin, to, to uh, Dallas, and it was specifically for that purpose. So. Those people that don't think that people make decisions based on taxes are, are, are somewhat blind. <laughs> That's all I hear all day long is, you know, what am I willing to sacrifice? Because we're in Minnesota I and mean, we've got a high tax bracket here too. So, I mean, there's people like as they're ramping up to sell or something, it's like, how do I get the hell out of this state as fast as possible? And then there's some people that just love their family and love their state enough where they're just willing to suck it up and take it. But I mean, people make decisions on that all day long. And, you know, when you, when you think about the high tech companies and the the fight for talent that I think is going to be even greater going forward because we've got this huge gap in uh, people that are you know going to step up and take over businesses or step up and take you know the high uh, demand jobs of the coders or whatever it might be. I mean, those are people making six figures plus plus the big transactions that they're that's going to be probably one of the top parts of their decision making process. Oh, exactly, and then. And, uh there were changes in executive compensation being non-deductible that again uh, you back to your point about the high level panel the high executive talent then all of a sudden hiring those individuals are, are going to be more expensive can you explain that a little bit so the there is a cap on how much compensation is deductible and i believe it's around a million and they included uh, i think in the past, the CFO was not included in that category. Uh, it that changes that. So got it. Yep. All of a sudden, again, it's and there are a number of employee benefit changes that that I think that again you have to look through because it's it's like it, it's a changing world. So, and you know, I'm kind of curious that for my own, as I read these, you know, articles and you see all the, like the, it's funny, the stuff that actually leaks out to the public and people talk about, right? Cause there's the immediate stuff of, I think it was Starbucks and a bunch, you know, Verizon or whatever these big companies are that are giving immediate bonuses and, you know, immediate, you know, up, upping to the minimum wage. So you, you, you see these conflicting stories and, you know, depending on all the stuff that we talked about, there's probably a lot of reasons why, but you have those that are, you know, having this immediate cash because of their, their structures and how they're doing it. But then, you know, I read another article on, uh, I believe it was IBM and they hit their first rec- uh, their first growth in a quarter in 26 quarters, yet they got slammed with a $5.5 billion worth of the tax that they wouldn't have had. So uh, there's two completely different scenarios there where some people are giving money away and some people are getting hit. You know, where's the, uh, what's the answers behind that? I guess is my question. Well, let's, let's start with the, uh those that gave big bonuses uh, besides enamoring themselves with the president, which I, people ought to be doing that all the time. <laughs> yeah. but, but, if, but if you get down to the math, you're getting a 35% deduction if you pay it, if you paid it last year versus a 21% deduction if you waited <laughs> a couple of days. Yeah. So, so it's like, well, all these, and it, it, it's humorous being a tax professional and, and, and listening to the news because everybody has like their bent on 
this was good or bad, but at the end of the day, it's like, hey, I take a deduction of 35% every day versus 21. And right. it, it, yeah, it, maybe I care about my employees, but at the end of the day, it's, hey, uh, I, I got a better tax deduction by doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and now, now you talk about the, the earnings, you talk about the earnings reports that are coming out from companies. If you think about it, um, they have deferred tax assets that are valued at 31 or 35 percent. All of a sudden, those assets are only, as they turn around, are only going to be worth, a, a, instead of a 35 percent deduction, when it turns, it's only going to be worth 21 percent. So they take a big hit in the, the financial statements because all of a sudden, that the asset they had is not as valuable as it was last year. So, so. So you, uh, I think a lot of the companies are, they they kind of spell that out. They, they're calling this a one-time charge, but again, for for if if you're doing your stock analysis, you need to get into the details. And like uh, we talked at the beginning of the program, there were a lot of provisional type of items, so companies will be adjusting those throughout the year. But um, it, it does change the landscape in terms of. Um, of what the financial statements look like. If if, if they were uh, an asset 35%, now it's 21%, that's, there's, there's a difference there. So those, that's obviously going to be a little bit bigger impact on and you know asset-heavy industries, correct? Exactly. So the, as those deductions, instead of turning around at 35%, now they're at 21%. So, so again, that, that, that's why I love this, because all of a sudden tax is important. We've got, we've got the the assurance people in our business that all of a sudden, wow, instead of not inviting tax to meetings, we're going to all the meetings. So, <laughs> that's what people care. Yeah, it's the weather. Not that they didn't invite before, but anyhow. <laughs> it's it the is, weatherman it's with the storm, go. for sure. <laughs> it is. It's good to, good to be important. So, you know, when you're looking at, you know, if you're a business owner and you, know, you obviously you've got some preparation for operating and you're, you know, and you're, Thinking, I, I thinking more about the the exit possibilities. I mean, how do you start? Where do you start with all this stuff and weighing all these variables together? Uh, so, uh, one thing that and again, I've been through a few um, deals over the past year, and you still have some tried and true principles that that you ought to be applying. And one is, uh, it, it's a readiness concept, and we call this either IPO readiness or exit readiness. But basically. If you need to have your books and records uh, and have a, a full everything fully analyzed, I mean, uh, oftentimes there's areas of tax law that people you know let slide, like sales tax. They, they're they're in business in a bunch of different states and they haven't been collecting sales tax. What happens on a, on a deal is if when the due diligence team comes in and does diligence on your company and finds out that. You haven't uh, dotted all your I's, crossed all your T's, and determining what that liability is. Then uh, it does a couple things. One is it makes them dig deeper into everything else. So there's a, a major time drain on on you trying to put the information together. But the other thing is you're going to take a haircut because all of a sudden they're going to determine, hey, what is the most uh, conservative liability out there because you haven't taken care of business yourself. And you're going to take a haircut on first price. So, so the way this becomes important is that was always important to be ready before, but now you've got this change in tax law, and part of your dialogue with the potential acquirer will be, hey, this is how we've treated these things, and this is how they're going to be under new tax law. If you don't have a clear, a clear crisp dialogue on how that happens, you could take a valuation hit or they're going to dig deeper and it's going to be a major time drain. Right. And, you know, I actually just, you know, peeling that a layer deeper too. It, it, do you actually see like the before and after, do you actually see valuations? I mean, it's probably too early to tell, but valuations being impacted because of how things are deducted or different things like that. I mean, are, are you going to potentially see lower valuations depending on industry and such? Again, we're in January. This has happened in December, so I've not seen it yet. But but again, it just if get get getting back to what you can expense. If you can expense something immediately, that you know your ROI is definitely going to change, and therefore your ability to what you should pay for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the the other thing, and we talked about this before, is I just think that there's going to be a lot. There's a lot of cash out there mm -hmm. that that 
and and maybe from sources that you didn't think of before because they brought that money back and they haven't been active in the market or they simply go down from a 30 35% to a 21% rate right? and they've got to deploy that cash well and so, I th- so I, I, yeah well I was going to say I think it, you know you brought up an interesting point too because I think you know there's this whole world of and you guys got a big division too um and I believe uh Bill is actually a scheduled to come on the show at some point, but, um, you know, the whole M and a space and the advisors that are out there knowing that they should start looking in different, in different places for these potential buyers too, and not just, you know, blindly following your, your investment banker because they've always been able to do it because I think the landscapes are changing enough that you should be asking questions regardless. Oh, definitely. And, and again, I, I take it back. So I do have a deal that's going on right now where we're advising a company where, they had, had they looked at the company, well, I want to say back in September time frame, and you know the, the majority of the multiples are, are run off from EBITDA, but our advisors had said companies still run cash flows, and so if they did their cash flow analysis back in September with a 35% rate, and now on a go forward basis there's a 21% rate, they're getting a big benefit there. So. So we've advised our people to bring that into the discussion to say, you know what, there's the multiple that, that you've been dealing with, but you're going to be getting more cash. Therefore, I think you ought to pay more for it. <laughs> Which is legit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I just had to know here. It's just, just kind of a humorous one. But so entertainment deductions are no longer deductible. And so you talk about how we do business. It's like a lot of it's on the golf course. A lot of it's during uh, basketball, football games. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Do you still make those same business decisions knowing that you're not going to get that deduction? I was going to ask you about that because that was like when we sold, that was like, it's funny because I got a presentation that I do in front of business owners. And when I always say, by the way, when you sell your company, you no longer have that company credit card and everybody laughs because everybody (laughs) uses it like for, I mean, all the concerts, all the stuff that anywhere you talk business, you know, you could potentially write off. So I I mean, are they going to have, is there going to be a way where you can classify that stuff as sales and advertising instead? Or is it like literally no food, no entertainment, like is a no-go? I mean, how does that? So so, so the meal is still deductible. It's just the entertainment. And so, and so I, we were having a discussion yesterday. It's like, okay, so all of a sudden is that food going to be a lot more expensive now and that (laughs) entertainment can be less value? You know, again, it's like that. My, my guess is the IRS is going to see through that. But, but again, it, it, all of a sudden, if, if you're in a town that has a, a, a crappy basketball team and you're paying for that suite, is that decision going to be a little bit different now that that, that, that decision becomes more expensive? Or, or on the flip side, are they going to have to charge less for their product, right? So, wow, that's so amazing. The, so, so if you're in the entertainment business, that's probably not a good thing for you. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, did you have, uh, you're either going to have to make your product better or you're going to have to give a discount. And that's a huge deal because, uh, so we used to, at our, at our old company, you know, work with the Minnesota wild and all these sports teams. And you have this awesome barter go back and forth between services. And then you'd be able to write off the suites that you had every single year, yeah. every single concert. And, you know, we'd like pack the concert full of half family and friends and half employees because it was, you, you already committed to it, but I mean, you're not going to as loosely make those decisions when it's 16 grand a pop per suite. Yeah. Think about that. Is that, that- I, I think that that could change the dynamics of certain things. Yeah, there's and definitely. If you're an in, <laughs> and, and if you're like the salesman, that, that that's when your whole life is take, taking people out on golf outings, and all of a sudden uh, that could be sad for him. <laughs> sad, for right? You're gonna, right. You're going to have to figure out a new different talent or something like that. I mean, it's it's a challenging thing. Or like, I mean, the, the fair weather fans that are out there already and you just go to the, I mean, the twins up in Minnesota have been uh, up and down all the time. And, you know, you'd, at the end of the season of a horrible season, you'd be begging people just to go out and drink and go to a twins game with you because you already have the tickets. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm in Sacramento and I've been through a few of those years where <laughs> Uh, my favorite was we used to have courtside seats in the old arena and uh, I just moved down from Seattle and I, I got them and it was the Kings Clippers game and I call a client and I said, hey, I got the 
the King's Clippers game. You want to come? And there was like silence on the phone. And the <laughs> the client said, he said, he said, James, did, did we do something wrong? Did we not pay a bill? I, he goes, what, what makes you think I want to go to a Kings game, let alone a Kings Clippers game? But anyhow. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, you so know what? Discussions are, I think they're going to be coming up. I, I mean, then another fraud is just the impact on charitable. Right. Well, actually, uh, let's let's go into that because I think that's a huge deal too. Because a lot of businesses, you know, they they, you know, and charities. I've sat on the board of multiple charities before, and you out like we used to always go to our vendors for the big, huge, you know, ticket stuff and the write offs and all that kind of stuff. So, how, what do you see the the ripple effect being? So, so the charitable is more on the individual side, is side of my deduction side because I, you're still going to get not i'd have to double check on that but uh, it, it's more on the individual side if you don't itemize then all of a sudden because they've increased the exemptions mm -hmm. so this one um uh, because charitable contribution it's really for the individual on, on the on the corporate side i don't think that's a fact that okay. i have to double check that which is but actually it, i really mean good. But that that's impactful on the charities because that means that the charities are gonna they should be hitting up the businesses harder than because they're gonna be losing a good chunk of their their people that just would you know throw the last little bit towards them. So I mean I think that will impact um, the businesses and the people at, at the same time. Oh yeah, and and again it's, it's I mean the high income guys they're still gonna get those their deductions because they're gonna itemize, but it's. It's the uh, you know I I've, I've been I've been told or at least I've read articles that so there's these rank and file people that make less money that all of a sudden won't itemize it all of a sudden that becomes a decision for them. Well, as we're kind of wrapping up here, James, I mean, is there you know because we talk about a lot of different things here and and there's still a lot to be determined as 2018 unfolds over the next 11 months. I mean, is there anything you want to highlight or maybe reiterate to the listeners? I guess. Uh, gets back to, to planning and execution and again if, if if you have thoughts of being acquired or going public in the future that uh understanding what the changes are not only how they affect your taxes but the indirect how it may affect your business and that it's not business as usual that you can't put your head in the sand that and just say hey i'll, I'll continue to do things the way they were because uh, again i think that this has become a disruptor and for certain industries more than others but i again i think any great business uh taxes well in the past it, i always used to say you know you're taxed on 35 percent and if you go and say maybe 40 percent of your income don't you shouldn't you spend a little bit more time on that that area to see ways to minimize it and ways to make sure you're getting it right so you don't have problems in the future Right. It's a big deal. I mean, you you work so dang hard to make all the money, <laughs> like make sure you're doing it right. So you can keep as much as you can. Exactly. Exactly. And it, and it's one of these things where, I mean, I think our firm, the day after the bill was signed, we put on a webcast. We've had webcasts. If you get on the EY site, then you, you can get a lot of webcasts and information on it. But, um, my my concern is if if you're not one of the larger firms, then your ability to get answers on some of these complex questions may be difficult. Um, and therefore, having uh, a source of uh, we we've, we've got a national tax department that all these people do. Uh, we we hire people from the IRS, people that specialize in in the code, and therefore they know what the rules are. They talk to the people, and they know what the changes are going to be. And so so. Talking to a qualified advisor, I know it sounds totally self-serving, but in this gets, in this situation of complexity, I, you got to be doing it, or else you could uh, have some surprises. Down yeah, the road. These surprises that are not enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. James, what's the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? I, I think if you get on the website uh, ey dot com, uh, I think depending on where you live, we've got offices. Uh, uh, I think uh, throughout the world and definitely in the U S and, and the contact information would be there. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you.